Hello, welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining us today. The sermon title today is Jesus has given us privilege. So how, do, how do we handle the privilege that Jesus has given to us? Before we get into that, let's examine what we are privileged to have in our lives in Jesus. What does that look like for us? Well, Jesus has reconciled us to our Heavenly Father by dying on the cross and shedding His blood for us, and then being raised from the dead in the resurrection. He has since given us His righteousness, and we have an intimate relationship with our Father, our elder brother, and our friend Jesus, and our comforter, the Holy Spirit. Let's notice that over in 2 Corinthians 5, as Paul describes it, and see the privilege that we have in Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, Paul says this, For Christ's love compels us, so God's love compels us to recognize what we've been given through Jesus Christ. Because we are all convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was, was raised again. But Paul continues because it took the Son of God, or the Son of Man, to be the sacrifice for us, to pay for sin, and then to give us life through his resurrection. In verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view because it's now only a spiritual point of view that we have. The privilege we have is to be able to think about things from a spiritual point of view, to have the mind of Jesus, as it says in Philippians 2, and therefore to have our actions that we have in our lives reflect that, His mind, in us. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. So we have Jesus living in us through the Holy Spirit, and the Father lives in us as well, because we are this new creation. The old is gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So therefore, it's this special relationship we have with our Heavenly Father through the being reconciled in Jesus Christ that we can participate with Jesus in His ministry on the earth today in this way. It's a matter of relationship. So what happened when we were reconciled is that it shows that God was reconciling in verse 19 the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them so without that being done for us we could not be in this privileged place we are uh, but it has been done and therefore we are privileged to be forgiven of our sins and in relationship with our God Father Son and Holy Spirit and he's committed the, to us, therefore, the message of reconciliation. Uh, privilege has its responsibilities, and uh, we have to recognize what those are. Uh, we have to look at them through the lens of Jesus in our lives, so we can know how to approach other people, how to deal with other people as we live our lives. In verse 20, <clears throat> we are therefore Christ ambassadors. So we represent His kingdom on the earth today as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So here we have this privilege of being able to show people how we are reconciled with God and then how they can also participate in that relationship. So in verse 21, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus, in this relationship, has attributed His righteousness to us. We didn't do a thing to receive it. We just <clears throat> believed in Him, and He gave it to us. Now what are we going to do with that? See, how are we going to express His righteousness to those we come into contact with? See, again, privilege has responsibility. 
we've been given something, a free gift, we have to be sure we pass it out appropriately at the right time in the right way. So we're privileged to have hope, peace, love, and security in those relationships that we discussed in 2 Corinthians 5 that many others do not have that privilege. They do not have the assurances that the privileges that we have in Jesus Christ give us. So we need to show others they are included in this privilege and to help them receive it. Those of us who know our true identity as beloved children of our Father are privileged to know we are forgiven, accepted, desired, included as an heir, and loved unconditionally. Galatians 4 shows us that. Galatians 4 beginning in verse 1. Galatians 4 and verse 1. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. Paul's trying to make a point here as to when God made it possible for us to be the actual heir of his estate, or co-heirs, as it says in Romans the 8th chapter. Verse 2, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So it's when the Father so loved the world that He sent His one and only begotten Son, Jesus, to us, that that was the set time for that to happen. That's why it's such a special time in history. In verse 3, So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elementary or elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, as all the prophets had directed everyone to think and to be aware of the Messiah being sent to us. God sent His Son, born of a woman who happened to be, needed to be, a virgin. Born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. So God, uh, with intentionality, wanted all of us to believe in Him through His Son Jesus so we could be heirs of Him. And again, as Romans 8 says, we're co-heirs in Christ because of our believing in what the Father has done for us in sending His Son to us. In verse 6, because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So, because we are heirs, we call out, Abba, Father, as well. Through Jesus and what He's done for us on the cross and how we have been reconciled to our Father. In verse 7, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are His child, God has made you also an heir. Now that's wonderfully good news, you know, if you stop to think about your future. How do we plan for our future? Well, we try to have a retirement fund, don't we? Hopefully, hopefully the stock market doesn't fall and fail us. Our pension goes dry for some reason. Or we have so many health problems that it uses up all the funds that we have for our retirement just to stay alive. So many things could happen or, or not happen in trying to plan our own future physically. But thankfully our future spiritually is totally taken care of. And Jesus has made sure of that. But as we live this life then, with Him having guaranteed us that we're going to be heirs and co-heirs with Him, then that gives us the opportunity to know, well, you know, He's probably going to help me today too. Because of His relationship with me, and the relationship of the Father, and the relationship of the Holy Spirit with us, we have a personal, intimate relationship with the One who controls all things. And they want to help us as we're His children. But we're His beloved, see. And so we recognize that this gives us a tremendous privilege in this life to be able to serve others in a way, in a way, a greater way than we might do otherwise. And I know that's certainly true for me. Now this is a daily thing. It's a growth thing. We grow in His grace and knowledge. 
We grow in the knowledge and the grace of Jesus every day, hopefully. That's what we want to do. And so Jesus gives us an opportunity. So he gives us this parable over in Luke, the 14th chapter, which is an interesting parable. So join with me, if you would. Luke 14, beginning in verse 1, and we'll go through verse 14. Luke 14 and verse 1. <coughs> So one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. So he wasn't there because uh, the Pharisee was going to honor him, which is usually why people invite you to a dinner, but to carefully watch him because uh, the Pharisee had many others who were experts in the law, it says here in the parable, who were also invited. So they were just going to see if they could find something they could criticize him about. Of course, Jesus knew this. This is, this is what they were up to. They, they were about their own business, not about the business of, of God. In verse 2, there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Now, I was trying to figure out whether the man was in the dinner party or not, and I concluded he was Kind of like going up to the house, he met the man who had this abnormal swelling because of what Jesus says after he heals him. But this is a Sabbath day, and the Pharisees thought it was not proper for anyone to heal on the Sabbath day. So Jesus knows this, of course. Well, he knows it's very appropriate to heal on the Sabbath day because he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and he knows what he created it for. He created it for man. For the benefit of man, not to their detriment. So he's going to engage the Pharisee who has invited him to dinner to carefully watch him. And also he addresses the experts of the law who were there. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And uh, they didn't say a thing. They remained silent, so taking hold of the man, see, because he he knew that man needed to be healed. <laughs> what was the what was the case here? If you can relieve suffering, why don't you, see? And he knew he could, so he was going to do that. And he healed him, and then he sent him on his way. That's why I figured he's not, he wasn't actually in the house when this happened. He was kind of beating up to the front door of the house. So in verse 5, they ask him, or the, sorry, then he asked them again, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, Will you not immediately pull it out? Of course, the law allowed for that. It's called the ox in the ditch. Of course, you would you would do that for your animal. You also then, of course, then do it for your child. Well, wouldn't you do it for this suffering man? So it makes sense that since you have privilege, the, these men, the Pharisee and the experts in the law had privilege, they invited Jesus share their privilege with. But they were ignoring and avoiding the man who needed their help. And they pushed him aside. So Jesus didn't do that, did he? He also had privilege. He was the son of man. He was also the teacher, the master teacher. And so he was doing a little teaching here. So you ought to then be also taking care of this suffering soul here. But they also had nothing to say about that. Because they knew they would be found guilty if they tried to answer that question. In verse 7, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. It's interesting sometimes what leads up to the parable. Which is just as important as the parable itself. Because you see, the host needs to be the, the one who had the privilege at the dinner needed to provide leadership in taking care of people who were there and in the surrounding area so in verse 8 he says when someone invites you to a wedding feast do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited now you can almost imagine i can at least you have, you have the main Pharisee, the owner of the home. Then you have he invited experts in the law who were, you know, 
fellow Pharisees with him, people he knew well, and so they were going to try to get the seat of honor. That's what Jesus knew. <laughs> so he knew that they were going to be kind of like playing musical chairs, you know. So which, which one's going to be able to get the, the closest to the seat of honor in, in, at this dinner that's possible? So he was saying, I be careful because, you know, if you, if you set yourself up in a seat of honor, then you may be asked to move to another seat and allow someone else to come and be seated in that seat. In verse 9, so the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important seat. So where do you imagine Jesus would have sat at that table? He would have taken the least seat, wouldn't he? He would have had to have been invited up to a higher seat around the table. Because he, he understood he had privilege. He was the son of man. He had great privilege, but he didn't use it to honor himself. He used it to serve. See, he healed the man as he came to the house. And so that's a good lesson for all of us. You know, we're privileged, but we don't have to act like we should be honored. If we're honored, well, we can accept that gracefully. But that's not for us to determine. It's for the host, wherever we are, to determine that. So, friend, so if you take the lower seat, then the host will come up to you and say, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of the other guests. And that's how that would work in a very amenable way. Verse 11, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And Jesus wasn't through yet. Verse 12, he continues on with a different aspect of what he's been talking about. So then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, which he had done, except for Jesus. No, they only invited him so they could keep a close eye on him. Don't invite just your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, so you will be repaid. Wrong reason to invite people. Uh, not that you can't invite people the other way at all, but I mean, if, you're, if your intention is to help people, well then, don't do it that way. But in verse three, 13 it says, so when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. So use your privilege to help those who really have need. Serve those who are suffering. You have the capacity to do that, do it. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So what do we do with our privilege? Well, we want to do what Jesus would do in our living. See those who have need and serve them. Minister to them in some way or the other. It's not that we don't do that ever, because we do. It's just sometimes our mindset is not exactly what it ought to be, and the Word helps us to see, oh, I see, I see a better way. And then we make some adjustments and corrections, and that's a good thing for us to do as we go through life. As it says over in John 13, <coughs> and verse 34, Jesus gave us a new commandment. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you, love one another. Well, that's not the new commandment because that was stated before. But there is a new caveat to that. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Ah, okay. So as Jesus has loved us, that's how we should love one another. So he came as the Son of Man, to show us how to do that. How to love one another. So who did he go to? He went to the sinners. <laughs> he went to the downtrodden. He went to the hopeless and helpless. He loved them. See, he sought out those who no one else would seek out. And he loved them. So he said, do that. In verse 35, by this, 
everyone will know that you are my disciples. There will be no doubt about it. If you love one another. So there are different ways that we can love each other. We can do it according to our giftings. You've all been gifted through the Spirit. We can do it through our circumstances, our situations, our personalities. You know, however we have the opportunity. So we all have to take stock of how our privilege allows us to serve others and then do that. And the best way I've found for that to happen is that we just are led of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit prompts us. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Or we may use our mate to prompt us because they're inspired <laughs> and they give us something like that for us to think about that we hadn't thought of before. So there's over in Romans 12, there's a uh, kind of a listing of things that the Apostle Paul gives us to think about as far as showing love to one another. Romans 12 and verse 9. Romans 12 and verse 9 is where we'll begin. It's uh, titled in my Bible, Love in Action. In verse 9, love must be sincere. So whatever you do, do it with a sincere heart. Hate what is evil, because that's not going to be loving anybody. Cling to what is good, because that will help people. Be devoted to one another in love. See, so everything has to be from the premise, and from the the direction of love. So what do we do with our enemy? Because we all probably have an enemy or two. Well, Jesus says in Matthew 5, we'll pray for your enemy. And it's amazing what that will do for us and them. Because this is what the children of God will do with an enemy. They'll pray for them that they'll come to know Jesus like they know Jesus. Pray the blessing. Pray that they also will receive the privilege that we have knowing Jesus. So honor one another above yourselves. It says that over in Philippians 2. You know, do not be a, a, con a conceited mindset, but to honor others <coughs> better than yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So when we serve the Lord, we serve each other. We serve those who truly have the need that we need to help fulfill if we can at all. If we don't have it, maybe we should pray about it that we, or someone else would have the need or the capacity to fill that need. In verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. So we saw what Jesus said about hospitality there in Luke 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You see, that's why we have this spiritual orientation. After being reconciled, we are a new creation. We look at things through the Spirit now. We don't look at things through flesh. Someone, you know, does something wrong to us, but we want to do exactly the same thing back to them. So it, Paul says, don't do that. You're, you're of a different mindset. You've been brought into that personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, and you have his mind, so use it. And think, what would Jesus do in this situation? He would give a blessing and not a curse, because that's what he does. In verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. See, there's a lot of good times to rejoice in life. Do that. Don't miss out on those times. But then be willing to mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. See, whatever you need to do to have peace, do that. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. See, it's not about us. We're included, but it's not about us. It's about everybody else. And then when it's about everybody else, then they make it about us. <laughs> funny how that works. If we're willing to give up us and thank them, then they thank us. <laughs> and they're thankful for the most part, usually. In verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Because tooth for tooth, that doesn't work. Someone's going to get killed with that approach. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So there is 
kind of a, we don't cave to just particular sentiment. But by the same token, if we try to work out or reconcile with people a situation, we can usually find an, an agreeable conclusion, is what Paul is saying here, I feel. So, as it says here, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. See, but leave room for God's action in it. So we pray to God about a situation. If He wants to take action, that's up to Him. He knows them better than we do. So we ought to leave room for God. If He's going to do something to help them learn a lesson, well, let Him do that. We don't need to show them what's up. <laughs> so we understand our place. We know that God has His place in all of these things. So leave room for Him. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, Paul says in verse 20, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. <laughs> it's amazing what food at a time like that does for a person. It calms them down, helps them realize it's not as bad as they thought. Someone actually does care for them. <laughs> They all don't hate them, you know, all the time, like they were thinking. So, if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. When you're really thirsty, what you really need is a drink of water. Because you're really thirsty. <laughs> and you really appreciate it. If someone give you, a, as it says in the Gospel, a cold glass of water, what a blessing that is to do that for someone. In doing this, see, if they've got a bad attitude toward you, you'll end up heaping burning coals on their head, not intentionally, but I mean, they'll just feel like they were, why should they have felt that way about you? And look what you're doing for them, see. So it's kind of a self-ministering kind of uh, action you take. It helps them to realize they weren't doing the right thing, thinking the right thing. So, in conclusion, to the listing of love in action it says do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good so we have been given this wonderful place this privilege to know Jesus now right now today it's a blessing to our soul sometimes we don't always think about the privilege we have in knowing Jesus because sometimes we see people not being uh, caring or concerned about how Christians are doing and a neighborhood or, or even in our nation at times. But yet, if we know that we have been privileged to know Jesus and we've been reconciled by Him to our Heavenly Father and we have a relationship, an intimate relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and we have the power to love. We have the power to love like Jesus loves. He changed the world in His lifetime. And His death and His resurrection cap that off. But he changed the world. He wants us to participate in changing the world from hate to love. And the only way we can do it is to do it to the people we happen to meet, people we happen to have relationship with. Uh, but we can also meet a stranger, and God can inspire that conversation just as well. But we realize we have been given a blessing. We are privileged to know Jesus and we want everybody else to be included in that. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing us together with you. We are in you, and you are in us. And we are your children. And we know Jesus loves us. And we want to love others as he loves us. So thank you, dear God, for blessing us today and helping us to realize that with privilege comes a responsibility, a responsibility to serve as you serve. And we ask and pray that as we do that, as your children, we can help the world know you, to know you that you are so caring and loving. Why would we ever have pushed you away before? So we thank you and ask your blessing this coming week. It's in the precious and holy name of Jesus that we pray, and all together we say, Amen. Amen.